Okay, I want to thank uh, Patrick and Butch for organizing such a great meeting for us all. And the second is a way of an advertisement. I need to get to the Eugene Airport sometime tomorrow morning. <laughs> if anyone else is going to the Eugene Airport, maybe we could share a taxi or something of that sort. Or if you're driving yourself, please let me know. I could use a ride. The shuttle service I thought existed no longer exists. OK, now, I, I've actually never collaborated with Steve, although I I've, I've first met him when we were colleagues at the University of Chicago. And we talked extensively uh, about science and, and many other things. And then I visited Steve and Lynn in Snake Camp, uh, it must be 10 or more times, where we also talked extensively and did other things extensively. Um, <laughs> but he's been very influential in my career because he convinced me that you really can confront real theory with data and learn something useful. Because when I started in population genetics, theory and data were quite separated. And uh, I mean, sometimes you'd mention, well, this, you know, this theory could explain these patterns, but it wasn't a meaningful comparison. It was just sort of a symbolic comparison to satisfy the reviewers. Um, in fact, we, in those days, we always said, well, you know, if only we had enough data, we could answer all the fundamental questions in evolutionary biology. Well, you have to be careful what you wish for, because we're drowning in data now. And we haven't really answered all the fundamental questions in evolutionary biology yet. Uh, we're still trying. Um, Steve also had a great influence on my daughter, who came to snake camp. And he took her out night driving. And she told me that one day they were out. And he said, hold out your hands like this. And he put a leech in her hand. And he said, I want you to know how it feels to have a leech in your hand. And she was going, <laughs> you know, this was a seven-year-old girl or something. <laughs> But uh, no, she, she said if she had spent two or three more years going to snake camp in the summer, she probably would have become a biologist instead of a dancer, which is what she is trying to be now. And I would have been very grateful for that, uh, <laughs> that difference. <laughs> OK, so, so my talk is also not going to have uh, anything to do with Steve's work. It's a talk I had prepared for another purpose. Uh, there'll be a lot of detail on the slides that I'm going to ignore. Um, what I've, I've worked on in the past several years is the, the population, genetic, population genetic models of range expansions, uh, motivated first by studies of humans and then by lots of other species which show evidence of range expansions. And just to, to orient this for people who are not familiar with this portion of the literature, a, a geographic expansion of a population into a new range almost inevitably is accompanied by a series of uh, founder events or genetic drift events at the, at the leading edge of the population expansion. Because typically, you expect a small number of individuals to colonize the new area and then grow into a bigger population. And various models of this exist. Either a continuous model where you have a few founders, oops, or you have a, a, a demic model where you have a new population founded by a small group. Um, and so you have a continu continuing uh, episodes of founder events, and that has genetic consequences. Now, this, th there's been many simulation studies of this process. One notable one was by Ramachandran et al., who first noticed that the heterozygosity in humans, this was in, uh, quantified with microsatellite loci, heterozygosity decreased almost as a linear function of distance from Africa. They used Addis Ababa as the, the origin. And they could fit this with a, a simulation model, which is the lower graph, of, of founder events of a reasonable size and a reasonable number. And they, they weren't claiming that this represents human history, but they showed that this aspect of human history was consistent with a very fairly simple model. And cavalli sforzas group also asked the question about the origin of alleles. 
and show that if you have a range expansion, then the, the geographic distribution of an allele and the center of mass of the allele is not anywhere near the point of geographic origin. Again, they did this with a series of simulations illustrated here and here. We'll and then another consequence of range expansions is that these periods of ep these episodes of genetic extra genetic drift can result in the fixation of deleterious alleles. And uh, Pichel et al. Uh, called this expansion load, that is the additional genetic load created by the series of founder events. And they showed on this graph that the frequency of uh, deleterious derived alleles that are, that are fixed in different populations increases roughly linearly with the distance from, from Africa. So the uh, ex uh, range expansion results in some predictable genetic, uh, genetic changes. Now what I've done in collaboration with Laurent Escoffier and others is to try to develop some analytic theory to, to quantify the underlying simplicity without just doing extensive simulations. And so what I will do is review the, the theory, the, the work that's been done in my lab and show briefly at the end an attempt to make some progress in this area. So just to be clear, what I call the serial founder effect model, you have a small propagule of K individuals increasing in size to some large population. And then a new propagule is formed from that larger population and so on down the line, creating a, a, a range expansion. And what I will call the idealized model has the larger population be of infinite size. That's obviously not an unrealistic, that's not a, obviously not a realistic assumption, but it's useful to conceptualize what's actually going on. Because when you have the founder event, you have K individuals chosen at random, that's your genetic drift. When that population blows up to infinite size, the allele frequency will no longer change. And so what you have here is a spatial recreation of a sequence of generations of genetic drift, which are each one then frozen in time. And so you have, on the bottom I show the series of founder events, and it's exactly analogous in this idealized model to a time series of populations, which you simply have kept the earlier populations around. And the reason this is useful is that we have a great deal of theory for a time series of populations. I mean, genetic drift, selection, whatever, what, recombination, whatever you like, is very well studied in a single po isolated population as a function of time. And so you just take that model and turn it on its side and adapt theory, and suddenly you have a theory of range expansions. So that's why we called it a spatial analog of genetic drift. So one thing that you can see quite easily, for example, is that if you have a low frequency allele in your starting population, you will generate, on average, a decline in frequencies of alleles that persist from one generation to the next. Because for a neutral allele, the expected change is zero, but the ones that go are lost are not counted because we're restricting, the, we're restricting the analysis to, population, to alleles where it's present in more populations. So on average, the change is zero, so the ones you see actually have, create a small climb. And we did some simulations. We did some analytic theory. The analytic theory fit the simulations, although there's a lot of variation. I mean, of course it fits. I wouldn't show you the results if it didn't fit. You know, I'm not feeble-minded. Um, and you can add selection. And when you add selection, you have to do a little bit of extra work because in the populations, even if it's of infinite size, selection will change the allele frequency. But you do, you take that into account and of course you get a nice looking fit just like that. So then I, I, I we generalize this theory to a more realistic, and I put this in quotes because of course it's not realistic, 
It's simply less unrealistic than the idealized model. So we allowed multiple generations of genetic drift before the next founder event. We allowed some migration between populations. Um, and what we showed is that you can define an effective founder size that takes into account these other processes. To, and when you use that effective founder size, you can use the theory of the idealized population to make your predictions. I don't show any more fits. I mean, you get the idea, it's going to fit. Now, then Ben Peter, who is a student in my, who joined my lab after uh, the first paper, came up with the idea that you could use this tendency to form clines as a way to create an index that indicates the, the occurrence of a range expansion and the place of geographic origin. So he defined what he called the, uh, the directionality index. And the directionality index, I mean, forget the formulas, the directionality index is just the difference in average frequency of alleles in two populations, when those alleles are present in both populations. And you can compute that even if you have just diploid genomic data from two populations. So what he showed by simulation is that if you have an equilibrium isolation by distance model, which is on the left here, then the directionality index is very small. You get a slight edge effect. Well, first, the top, the top graphs show that the, if you use F, pairwise FST, you won't get anywhere. There's no difference between a range expansion and an isolation by distance model. If you use the directionality index, you get very small values except for a slight edge effect. But when you have a range expansion, you get a very strong signal of the range expansion. We'll forget this completely. This allows you to locate the origin of the range expansion by using the theory called the time distance of arrival. This is the, the, the same theory that engineers use to track cell phones and other moving objects. When you compute the index between two locations, it, it maps out a, a hyperbola of equal values. And then you do two more locations and you map out another hyperbola of equal values. And when, you, and when those hyperbole cross, that's your origin. Now, in fact, in practice, there's, I mean, you do more than two, I mean, more than two uh, comparisons at a time and you use least squares and the engineers have all worked this out and taken account of error. So what Ben did was show that this works very well with establishing the origin of a range expansion. On the top left in figure A, that's an equilibrium isolation by distance model. And, of course, and the, the, the uh, values of the directionality index are relatively small. When there is a range expansion, you can locate that you can see the origin, it's in the, the white cross that's visible on the curve. And that's true even if you have only some of the population sampled. So we've had sparser and sparser samples. And you could, you could still both detect that a range expansion occurred and get a rough idea of its origin. And he, he looked at the case where there were barriers to the range expansion and uh, they are somewhat apparent when you look at the, the pairwise values of psi. And if you have two origins, you can figure out there, there were two origins instead of one. So it's, a, it's a quite, a useful, uh, quite a useful theoretical tool. And then he computed the directionality index for human populations, showing and this graph shows values only above a certain threshold, because otherwise it would be too confusing, and it allowed us to predict the origin in the San population in southern Africa. Okay, he continued, Ben continued with this work. Ben is now in Leipzig at the Max Planck Institute. And he, what he did was develop a method for estimating the net effect of genetic drift during the expansion phase as a function of uh, its per, uh, per unit distance result. And the idea is fairly simple. 
the populations to the left, that is closer to the source, experience fewer range expansions than populations to the right. So the last population has undergone D range expansions in this simple model. The first population has on, undergone only one. And so the effective population size for each population, shown in the formula in the bottom, is lower for smaller values of i that is closer to the source and larger for larger values of i that is farther from the source. And that allowed him to, to predict the slope of the pairwise values of psi as a function of distance under various conditions. Monty, are, you, yeah. are you possibly backwards in that statement? Is the, the effective size is lower if you're currently located near the source? No, the effective size is higher near the source because you have more generations of drift in the larger population state. When you're, in, when you're distant? No, you're clo closer to the source. You have one generation of genetic drift at the founder event, and then D minus one generations of genetic drift in a large population. Whereas in the far from the source, the end population, you've got D generations of genetic drift of intensity k and then one generation. So I think for a change, I, I'm right. But I, I have 25 cents if you would like to. <laughs> OK, the, so we, anyway, the, he developed some, some fairly fancy branching process theory, estimated the amount of genetic drift you would detect by plotting the directionality index against a function of distance and getting the slope, it's approximately linear. So he can, from that, he can measure, he can estimate the amount of genetic drift per unit distance during the range expansion. And this is his application to some Arabidopsis populations. Um, the yellow part of the graph is the, the location of the likely origin. So in Scandinavia, we didn't do very well. It sort of or it had to have originated someplace. But in Europe and in, in Iberia and in North America, we got a pretty good idea of where the, uh, the expansion originated. And he, this is what this shows is that the intensity of the expansion uh, was now I'm not so sure. It was different in the United States from Western Europe. It was either stronger or weaker. We'll just skip over that. OK. Um, so that's, that's the work Ben Peter did on range expansions. And the, the new work I've done is based on something that sounds very much unlike the, uh, the theory of range expansions. It was done by Anna Malaspinas. Uh, looking at a time series of samples and then estimating the extent of genetic drift and the selection intensity and um, the allele age. When you have a single, when you're tracking a single allele, and you could, this is an ancient DNA kind of study where you have populations of samples that you can, or of fossils of given age, and you get the allele frequencies. And you, uh, you go ahead and, est and then you apply this theory. So now I'll, I'll explain the theory, and then I'll explain why, it, uh, why it's relevant to range expansions. So the theory, the Malaspinas theory, you start with an allele that arose at time t0 in the past, and then you have a series of samples, that is, samples taken at different times from which your ancient DNA technology will allow you to estimate allele frequencies at different times. And you have a certain number of chromosomes at each time that you, you can analyze, and then you have a certain number of copies of the allele of interest at each time. So that's your data. And it may be easier to see here. There are two parts to this that you can separate. 
you have the number of chromosomes and you assume that underlying it is a true allele frequency. We'll call it X1, X2, X3, and so on. And so you're doing binomial sampling at each time independently, sampling, without, uh, sampling with replacement. So you have a binomial distribution given X and given the sample size. So that's one, one part of the result. Then you have to propagate X going from one time to the next. Well, that's genetic drift or genetic drift plus selection or genetic drift plus selection plus some dem demographic change. You have some model to get you from one time to the next. And you put these two models together and you have your data, which is the number of copies of the allele at each time. And then you have your parameters, which is population size, time of origin, selection coefficient, if you think there's selection, and anything else you want to put into the mix, some other parameter that you think is relevant, maybe migration, maybe population growth. Anyway, you have the data, you have a model that predicts the data given the parameters, so you have the likelihood. You stir well, you put in the oven, you bake at 350 degrees for 25 minutes, and out comes the likelihood of the parameters given the data. And what Anna showed is that this, uh, this works quite well on simulated data. I'm not going to, I'm not going to show the, the simulation tests of this. And then we applied it, she applied it to one, one data set. I mean, remember, you don't have many data sets like this yet. But this is the ASIP agouti signaling protein from horses, from fossil horses, uh, collected at different times. And this is the, I, I'm not an expert on horse genetics, but I think this is the allele that causes the black coat color of horses. Ancestral horses were more like roan, a roan color. Then the black allele came in. And then sometime after domestication occurred, then other colors and other patterns were, were found, or at least the alleles creating those patterns in modern horses were first detected. And the ASIP is the low, the, uh, the derived allele at that site is the, uh, I believe, the oldest of those. And so this shows the, the frequency of the, it says frequency of the allele, I should say frequency of the derived allele, which was very low in ancestral horses and then increased to a substantial frequency and then decreased. And so when she applied the, this theory to the, the ASIP allele, we get estimates. You know, they're, they're listed at the bottom. I've, so the allele is, arose 2,500 years ago. The, it was deleterious with a certain selection coefficient. And the effective population size of the horses we estimated is not ridiculous. Now, when you look at this, you say, now, wait a minute. Uh, aren't you making an, a rather false assumption? Isn't it possible that this was actually an advantageous allele initially and then became deleterious as other colors of horses became more popular among whoever, people who domesticated horses? I'd say, yeah, sure, I can see that too. Um, what we're doing is showing how the model works. If you add more parameters, you have no power to estimate anything. So this was a proof, this was done to illustrate that we can do this, not that we have really discovered the secret of horse evolution, that it was a, a deleterious allele that increased in frequency because of genetic drift. I don't, no one that I know thinks that was the case. Okay, now what has this got to do with, with range expansions? Well, I'm going back to the analogy I started with, where the time series of populations is analogous to the spatial series of populations during a range expansion. And so I thought that you could do the same kind of calculation with range expansions that, that Malaspinas and other, many other people have done with time series of samples and estimate the, the time of origin of an allele, the selection coefficient, and the effective population size during each expansion event. 
so I took this, I took this um, the Malaspinas theory, and I used it. The, the difference is by it, the difference is computational. When you do this over thousands of generations, you need a very efficient computational method to propagate allele frequencies. Because when you do likelihood, you don't just do it once. You do it a bunch of times and find your maximum likelihood estimate. When you've got three parameters, that's a lot of calculations. That becomes for the, uh, I mean, Anna had to, uh, to do some very fairly fancy computational uh, analysis uh, in order to get results in a reasonable time. Well, with range expansion, you don't imagine thousands or tens of thousands of expansion events. And so I just did proof in principle. I used 20 expansion events. And for that, I could just do a right Fisher matrix multiply boneheaded simple calculation, because that's all I felt like doing. And the question is, could, did that work? Could you, even with 20 populations and relatively small sample sizes, could you estimate the place of origin, the place of the geographic origin of alleles, and the effective population size and selection, if any, it was occurring? And I mean, to make the long story short, two out of three is not bad. You can, what the top graph shows, if you look carefully, is that even with sample sizes of Oh, even with sample size, 10 is on the left, 50 is on the right. That's the number of chromosomes sampled. So it's five individuals or 25 individuals. You get a pretty good estimate of the effective population size. You get a pretty good estimate of the place of origin. And you get a terrible estimate of the selection coefficient. Because it looks like this was a case with neutral alleles, yet it looks like the, the inference is telling you they were selected alleles. And when you have selected alleles, it doesn't do any better. You can't really tell the difference. Now, I haven't explored this enough because, to, because of the computational problems, which I haven't tried very hard to solve. But as I say, two out of three isn't bad. And it may be that you could combine information across loci and get, inform get more information about selection that's occurring. So that's all I have to say. Thank you, and thanks again for coming.